Uh, here, uh, just directly to my left, is Jared Hayes from the University of Michigan. Next to Jared is Jack Halberstam from the University of Southern California. And uh, at the end um, is uh, Neville Hode from the University of Texas. A number of issues have uh, obviously arisen that link up both, I think, the presentations from earlier today and the three that we just heard this afternoon. And I think the most pressing uh, that was addressed so forcefully, I think, by Jack Halberstam was how to decolonize global uh, queer and transnational studies. Uh, that, that is to say that we must be attentive to the local and vigilant ever to the critique of the imposition of Western epistemologies, languages, categories, among other uh, kinds of um, social forms. Uh, that is to say that at, at, at the same time, there is also a deep, often a deep incommensurability between uh, analytical and in institutional frames, I think both within the West itself, within the institutions of the university, as well as those that circulate within uh, global networks. And that leads to one of the, I, I think that Jack mentioned this in, uh, at the beginning of your, of your talk, and that is the, the question and the problem really of translation as global circulation, as much as sort of linguistic or uh, literary translation, uh, even in our most liberationist seeming vernaculars uh, of terms, whether it's queer or Tom, and I might want to challenge uh, the idea that the vernacular has a rather easy passage, whereas dominant language might have a more troubled one. So I think maybe we want to trouble even uh, Tom circulating or queer circulating in the ways that, uh, that we talked about earlier. That those are equally difficult, at times violent and damaging. Um, and, and then to sort of like begin with a question and, and uh, from, my, from myself and then maybe open it up to uh, responses to this and then questions for one another and then open it out to the audience uh, more broadly. And so my question drawing, I think, from the first paper by Jared, uh, by Jared Hayes about the problem of the example. That is to say, the example as a kind of singularity that must do double service to the local but must also stand in for the general at some, at some level, at some point, or it just is a singularity and not an example. But <coughs> once those uh, singularities enter into discursive circulation, whether globally or within even narrower bounds, uh, then they begin to stand in for the general, and then they must be problematized, whether it's Semenya uh, on the one hand or maybe Derrida on the other. Uh, so I wanted to, like, turn this out towards uh, the three papers and have you comment a little bit about uh, the example as a kind of problem and the examples that you used as sort of also being somewhat problematic. In my thinking, I actually wouldn't want Casta Semenya to be the example of anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that what Brenda Munro calls the Semenya affair is the occasion for a whole lot of colliding discourses. I mean, one usually generally wants an example pedagogically just to exemplify one thing. But I think in this terrain, every example is going to be overdetermined. And I would rather work inductively out of a, a specific set of historical circumstances, practices, even as they tend into identities, rather than try and make my instance, an example of a broader principle. Um, I just think that's ethically a little easier. And I think it requires a more careful mode of attention because you actually have to learn from what you're looking at instead of going in with your rarefied category and finding examples mm -hmm. of you know, gay men or lesbians in whatever part of the world you're looking at. Um, so I think the the you know, the example can be a negative lesson in paying a different mode of attention to what you're trying to constitute as an object of study in this difficult terrain. <laughs> well, I guess I'm a, a big believer in examples, period. And, um, <clears throat> you know, what is the alternative to having examples? But, you know, as we were talking about earlier, is sneaking very abstract high theory back in uh, that works completely without examples. Um, and in fact, I think it's, it's very important to have examples, but to understand what the relationship might be between the example and knowledge production itself, that you, you might want to make a claim for, for this example, which to go back to Dominic's question, that doesn't then necessarily stand as a universalizing claim, but is um, 
uh, a, a kind of uh, a claim that is made in relationship to other claims that could easily cancel it out. Uh, but at the same time, I think the pedagogical aspect is really important here. Um, I mean, we are in a university after all. One does want to think through phenomena and think through it with very concrete examples in order to see how the flows of power work differently in different sites with different bodies in relationship to different kinds of political regimes and so on. Um, examples are very, you know, examples are um, abhorred by philosophy, for example, um, and, you know, you can look at Judith Butler's Gender Trouble. She has one example in the whole book, which is a drag queen, and then that becomes the entirety of gender performativity, and that's why philosophers steer away from examples because it seems as if then the whole theory sort of boils down. Um, but as we know from, from teaching, um, in the absence of examples, everything sounds very ungrounded and the, the, the language of abstraction instead is, is wheeled in to make it seem as if, as long as one is engaging in a sort of high level theoretical discourse, one is doing something and I'm not sure that you always are. So for me, I really believe in the example, but I believe in multiple examples with conflicting statuses and maybe at odds with each other. And, and through that, then the example holds on to singularity, doesn't sort of tip over into universality or over, over to generalization. Right, or, or it does become um, the place of a certain generalization, but it might be something that you hadn't predicted. You know, I mean, a lot of this is about trying to think through how to produce knowledge in ways that, that does still have an element of surprise or unpredictability to it. And if you always know in advance the meaning of everything that you're going to look at, then why are you even looking at it in the first place? Yeah, I think um, I would agree with both Neville and Jack. My response then would be to, to use some slightly different terms, I think, to translate, perhaps, if you want to call it that. And um, so that in addition to the pedagogical usefulness of the example. I also think of the um, importance of the example in writing um, and uh, and reading, right? So, uh, you know, I'm, uh, when I situate what I do in a disciplinary way, uh, I, I tend to think about the way I read, right? Which is very much, I think, like uh, what Neville was suggesting, starting with the example and, and, and going out as opposed to starting out and looking in. That is, knowing what the example is the example of before reading the example, I think. So, um, um, and I think, you know, uh, Jack did a, um, to use an example of, of what I'm saying, uh, <laughs> uh, Jack, reading of anthropology, I think, um, uh, is, is very um, kind of instructive in that sense, right? The, uh, uh, because, one of the ways that I read his talk was as um, kind of uh, the, the cultural critic bringing to bear on anthropology what we do, which is read. And, um, um, and I would sort of characterize that as reading closely, I think. Um, uh, and so some of, some of the um, other regions I looked at in my own project, uh, I found it useful to, to um, precisely kind of bring examples from dif different disciplines together and see how they expose each other's silences, right? So that um, uh, uh, there's a kind of compar comparison going on, a comparatist uh, praxis of, uh, of reading um, uh, based on specific examples uh, as opposed to generalizations. Uh -huh. I'm wondering then if we go back down the other direction, if you might pose a question for one another. Um, about the talks that have been presented today, beginning with Jerry. <laughs> okay. Um, um, it'll take me a while to get to the question part, but uh, as I was um, uh, listening to Neville and uh, Jack, um, uh, some of some of the kind of questions they were uh, bringing up uh, re sort of resonated for me in relation to um, uh, kind of some of the very recent reading I've done in what some people have called uh, queer temporality. Um, uh, and of course, In a Queer Time and Place is, um, um, uh, is a great example of that. Uh, and it, it, well, well, actually, I, I think uh, queer temporality is, is one place where uh, um, work on queer temp temporality is one place where you see what I think is a, a very fruitful 
um, intersection that has happened between queer studies and post-colonial studies, where we think about um, the parallels between um, temporality and um, uh, kind of, how would I call it, uh, geographic or geocultural othering, right? So that, so that, so that the past becomes associated with, with a geocultural other uh, um, um, with which the West, for lack of a, a, a better term, uh, is in a colonial relationship, right? So the, so the, um, I mean, so it, it's one way, I think, for example, um, uh, the comments that you made today relate to previous work that you've worked on. It's not something that was really made explicit, but something I was thinking about uh, towards the end of the afternoon. So that would be, that's not a question, but I, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that or uh, how you would see that as working. I think the question of temporality is a really good one. It's, an, it's, a, it's a good framework uh, also to get away from questions of identities that can really stymie us. Um, I, I have lots of different questions drawing on all of the presentations. The first one would be to go back to Neville's question from the beginning of the day. It was a question really to Brenna and, and um, could also be asked of Jared, which is the status of cultural production in claims that one might want to make about the circulation of global knowledge. And, um, you know, it's, it, it also, there are all kinds of questions of translation there and who gets translated and who's read in translation and which kinds of literature um, even make it to the status of example would, would be interesting there. So I, especially given that, you know, Neville ended with the reading of a, a, a novel um, after making the critique, I think it would be, that might be fruitful for us to go back to, um, are we trying to say that in in the literary or in the cultural realm, realm, questions are less easily resolved and therefore stay in flux more, or there's more deconstructive possibility in a novel than if you're actually um, interviewing somebody, you, you know. Um, so that would be one uh, question. A question that I would ask to Neville uh, and to Steve Butterman would have to do with the, the global spectacle of transgenderism, and which repeats the local spectacle of transgenderism in the context of the US, where on any given day, on any given channel, there's some trans person who is being dissected on a talk show. Um, and is Casta Semenya, um, just to give you know, one name, um, an example not of the globalization of questions about transgenderism, but the globalization of the making spectacular of the transgender body. Uh, and that would be a different kind of current and a different kind of question. And I, I think that we, we, we need a more meta conversation there. Um, and then a very practical question, given my critique of anthropology, I would sort of ask to my, myself would be, well, what, what would constitute the uh, question of knowledge production? How should people produce knowledge about communities or <clears throat> practices that they don't already know about? Um, if it isn't learning the language and going into a community for a while, what would it be? Um, and, you know, do we... Do we have some, um, some models for that? Especially given that many of these questions outside of academia about the meaning of any given gender presentation often are connected to social movements and to claims that people want to make politically. Um, you know, are we, are we abstracting a conversation here away from these thorny material contexts? Okay, I think Jack stole that question, but I'm going to try and rephrase <laughs> it. But that's a good thing. Sure. 